Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're talking about strengthening, protecting, and restoring the environment with our special guests, Joel Johnson, President and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and Ebony Martin, Executive Director of Greenpeace. So thank you both for joining us. I am so, so happy to have been able to grab a, a, a small slice of your time, Joel and Ebony. It's just wonderful. And, and I've got so much to talk about, but I, I just want to express my appreciation for your presence today. Thank you so much, Mark, for having us. I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. Yes. And likewise, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, this is um, uh, a really timely conversation. Uh, it's going to be a big, big year for oceans. Uh, so really looking forward to it. So, Joe, we're going to go to you. Um, when we when we talk about our environment, it's it, it cannot escape anyone's notice that we people are affecting the environment on a planetary basis. Um, where I live right now, where we've had successive fires, we're seeing fires in in Texas, and there's no place that's immune. The shorelines, in particular, are impacted. We're we're finding plastics in our foods, whether they're their fish or 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 uh, our vegetables. It's just a real issue that we need to talk about, and then we also need to deal with it. It it needs to be discussed, and we together with all of our different interests as human beings need to find a way to preserve this environment. So, uh, mm -hmm. just sort of starting with you, the the National Marine Sanctuary was created about fifty years ago. Comprises. 620,000 square miles of marine and Great Lakes waters. Why does America and the world need a marine sanctuary? That is a great question, Mark. Uh, and let me jump right in by saying that uh, in my role as the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, in partnership with NOAA, uh, who administers these incredible uh, treasured waters, uh, I have learned very quickly that Sanctuaries and marine protected areas throughout the United States, they need a voice. And uh, and really, they they need a voice because of those incredible human impacts that you have described. I mean, just take a walk down any shoreline in America today, and you can really see the issues, whether it is trash and marine debris thrown up on the beaches, whether it is uh, dead and dying species um, that have been choked out by plastic pollution, um, or even just watching the shoreline erode and disappear because of the intensification of storms across the country. The places that our grandparents and great-grandparents grew up with um, look radically different today along our coastal communities. And, you know, this question of why do we need national marine sanctuaries? I think it's a bigger question, really. It's why do we need marine protected areas? And national marine sanctuaries are part of that strategy and they're significant for many reasons because these can be places that are protected because of, say, incredible maritime history. In fact, like the first U.S. Uh, sanctuary was created 50 years ago to protect a Civil War ironclad battleship, the U.S. Monitor. Or they can be set up to protect great ecological wonders like deep sea corals or even our shallow reef corals, like those that people are familiar with if they have been in the Florida Keys and maybe gone snorkeling. And they can be refugees for re refugees for endangered species like humpback whales in the Hawaiian Island Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. And they can also be of significant cultural um, importance. And I'm thinking about uh, places like Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument uh, on the uh, western northwestern islands of Hawaii, which are... Um, uh, cultural and sacred sites to native Hawaiians, but also protect great biodiversity and not immune to the human impacts. Marine protected areas are part of a larger strategy, you know, a global strategy, if you will, to protect biodiversity, which is this abundance of life on earth and our oceans, uh, our great lakes and seas. And they can help us to meet the goals of protecting enough water and enough land to reduce the impacts of climate change. For example, the 30 by 30 initiative globally, you know, to set aside 30% of land and water has its uh, American uh, 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 version of it in the President Biden's America the Beautiful initiative. And that's ostensibly um, the creation of new uh, public lands, if you will, 
for nature um, that will help us to meet that 30% goal. And oceans, uh, seas, Great Lakes, places where there's a great abundance of life, um, they provide potential solutions in that strategy to increase our resilience and reduce these threats. So, I mean, I think on a practical level, America needs sanctuaries because we are connected to water in so many ways. Um, it's not just ecosystem benefits. Some of us have a deep spiritual connection to water. We are composed of water. We we feel better and have better, better mental and physical health when we're connected to clean water. And um, so ultimately- but there are also the practical you, aspects, right, Joel? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if we take a look at, for example, fisheries, right? And we've seen examples where fisheries have collapsed, most famously- the the uh, fishery in 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 Monterey, right? The anchovy fishery, which went from its highest harvest to zero harvest, and and basically killed the industry overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, Ebony, in order to create this and, and galvanize human opinion, Greenpeace has has a real reputation of of taking a walk on the wild side a little bit. Right. On being edgy, on making dramatic statements, on engaging us in ways where we can't look away. Uh, talk a little bit about that part of this, because what Joel's saying is that we need to do what's right. Right. What Greenpeace has done is sometimes yanked our attention, sometimes in ways that that. Uh, you know, those of us who are not paying attention to the environment on a daily basis find a little annoying. Right. But you yank our attention into the center of an issue, and then you start explaining it. Talk a little bit about how Greenpeace actually functions and the underlying evidence that you use to select what you actually invest in. Yeah, that's a great question. And as you said, uh, the world is so compounded right now with so many different things to pay attention to. And one of the things that Greenpeace has been especially good at is something that we call uh, creating mind bombs, because the soul of Greenpeace is to use peaceful protests to advance science and justice solutions and to ensure that we are growing consensus among um, our growing majority. And because of Greenpeace, we can now see that the majority of Americans are looking for action with regards to the climate. And the good news is that we have the technology, we have the scientific research, we know what justice demands, and we know that we need to uh, transition off of fossil fuels and more into clean and renewable energy. And we know that to do that, we have to galvanize people. And people are what, it, are, are what pushes that change and what um, makes our politicians do what justice demands in the moment. And we see this even recently with Biden's recent announcement to pause uh, the LNG build out in the Gulf South, which would affect a lot of our coastal lines and also a lot of our black and brown communities who are historically on the front lines and impacted by the climate crisis. And in this work, we are also looking to not only just uplift and amplify those voices, but also to drive the solutions because those solutions come from the people who are most impacted. It shouldn't be people sitting in Congress making the solutions. It should be the folks that are actually impacted. And what Greenpeace does is help to galvanize and drive that change and that shift so that we can see the changes um, that we need to see to advance a healthy planet and ensure our ocean is protected. The thing that I that that I really love about some of these examples that you both cite is that if you take a look at what what's gone on in Louisiana, you've seen the reduction of the wetlands and the protective uh, barriers that protect the land against and people against uh, hurricanes and and other weather events. You've seen that erosion. You've seen this idea, even the Army Corps of Engineers that was responsible for a lot of these, these uh, harms are coming back and saying, okay, we need to repair these areas. Now, if you suddenly put in an LNG uh, big facility there, um, that sort of work continues in terms of destroying those those protective areas along the uh, along the shoreline 
it doesn't mean that there's necessarily an, an easy answer because this, this country, this world seems to have an insatiable appetite for energy and carbon energy is going to be part of that future um, at least for the next uh, uh, couple of decades until we can figure out some other solution. But how do you actually triangulate so that you're not just talking about the Biden administration or or uh, the Democrats or your allies? How do you, Ebony, how do you create support for people who are farming in the interior of the country and have traditionally seen restrictions on their activities um, as an imposition. How do you get somebody who is a real conservative person um, uh, thinking in in ways that have been at odds maybe um, with your mission in the past? How do you get them to be part of your alliance? Because that's where the power is, is, is getting people together and working across the aisles. Um, if we're just talking about um, examples from natural allies, then are we just kind of missing the point? Really good point. Um, I think when we look at it, we have to appeal, first of all, to people's values. And at the end of the day, everyone wants clean water. Everyone wants clean air to breathe. Everyone wants to feel um, empowered to self-determination uh, and ensure that they are creating a better life for their, not only themselves, but their communities and future generations. And at the core, I think many Americans can agree on that and know that, you know, that seems like a basic right. And right now, our democracy should be one of the most fundamental tools that we have to advance climate solutions, and to ensure that we have clean air and uh, clean water. And right now, what we're seeing is our climate and our democracy are both under attack. And they are under attack by fossil fuel industries, other uh, extractive industries that are just looking to line their, po their pockets and to make a profit. And that is at the expense of our communities. And I think when we meet people where they are, actually understand the pain that they're dealing with and the uh, the things that they are trying to overcome and help them to understand that they do have agency and they do have power to change these things. And that is through engaging. That is through uh, ensuring that we are voting in climate champions and those, not just climate champions, but those that have our best interests at heart and that aren't working to dismantle uh, laws and different things that are, that are already set in place to protect our communities. And I think can sometimes- we get, climate, oh. Can we also get from, from a no mindset to a yes mindset? A lot of the examples we're talking about is no, we shouldn't build an LNG uh, terminal, or no, we shouldn't fish here, or no, we shouldn't develop there, where it's a no, no, no. Can we, in, in this part of American civil society, the part that is about protecting a uh, marine sanctuary like you are, Joel, can we get to a yes kind of a situation where we're basically helping people to profit from your work? We're helping people to benefit in other ways that they value, as you said, Ebony, so that we're in a yes mindset and not in a no mindset. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I can hop in on that one. I think it's a it's a great example um, of, uh, you know, frankly, like the power of people. And I think this is something that Ebony was talking about and, and you were asking about, Mark, which is, you know, people can uh, work from their values to, to get behind clean water. Uh, and a healthy environment. The National Marine Sanctuary System, in my opinion, is an incredible example of democracy. Sanctuaries are people powered. They're not just lines on a map. Um, they're in active coastal communities with recreational as well as commercial fishing and other kinds of interests that are all on our, along our coasts. And sanctuaries are often um, identified and uh, nominated by the local community that see something um, very significant and that's worth protecting, whether it's a way of life, like a sustainable livelihood, an ecological treasure or wonder, 
Um, and then in terms of how the Department of Commerce and NOAA work to manage those sites, they do it with an incredibly diverse community made up of representatives and a sanctuary advisory council uh, that, that tackles um, tourism, that tackles energy development, that tackles uh, state and, and local uh, regulation. And it's messy, it's challenging work, but it's work that's being done together. And um, I think there's incredible power in that example. Uh, to give you um, a sense of how far it can go, a place like the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary uh, on uh, uh, off the coast of Washington State is not only um, co-managed by NOAA, but also several uh, tribal nations that are directly protecting their cultural interests, their history, their relationship with, the, with that land and their way of life, um, as well as the incredible ecological resources there from steelhead uh, to uh, deep sea corals, you know, off the off that coast, it all is. And Ebony, you you have in Greenpeace, you have this initiative uh, called Ensuring Sustainable Seafood, right? That is, I mean, that links to as as Joel said, right? It it totally links to the marine sanctuaries because if the marine sanctuaries allow for spawning and allow for healthy fish uh, populations, that's a that's a prerequisite. To having that that resource uh, also, which builds tourism and build, you know everything that Joel's saying, right? So that's that's a way for to to not only um, be about uh, the no side, but also about the yes side. I think that that's I think that it's really important this this idea of being able to to um, engage people who don't necessarily who are not part of the traditional alliances for environmental organizations, because that is the future. I mean, we're all going to be living in this planet for a long time, aren't we, Ebony? Definitely. And I, I, as we all have just said, it, it kind of goes back to the values. We understand that um, we have to clean up the fishing industry, both in terms of ensuring that we have seafood that does not put our health at or our oceans at risk, but also um, that ensures we are not rampant in modern modern day slavery and the the abuses of those um, who are at sea and are um, doing this work and doing it in unjust and unsustainable ways. And oftentimes, the reason you can't get to a yes is because people don't understand the entire backstory and what has brought us to this to where we are. And if we continue down the path, oftentimes people don't understand where that will take us. So what we also have to do is invest in and educating our communities, also invest in meeting people where they are. I think sometimes we come in and we wanna just start strategizing and that's actually not the correct approach to take. I think the correct approach is to take is to understand first of all, what are the concerns of the community uh, what are the things that they are looking to accomplish? What things do they see as roadblocks and challenges in, in accomplishing that? And then how as we, as the larger organizations, um, can support and bolster what it is they're trying to do in their community and find ways where our goals connect and um, look for those synergies and build off of that. You know, it's very interesting what you've both done here. I, you know, I've been, I've been listening intently uh, Ebony, you just talked about this whole idea of of, of a, an industry um, functioning in a way that could advance modern day slavery. I I think that's that that's what you said. So so you've got um, a racial element uh, in that that comment, uh, Joel. You, when you referenced uh, all the sanctuaries, you referenced holy sites of native tribes, the empowerment of native tribes to control their own coastal areas and their voice, uh, their agency, the collaboration that uh, you benefit from. Um, you talk about some of the native Hawaiian uh, uh, sites and you have a different sensibility. Do you both connect what you do to an overall map of, of justice and, and engagement and empowerment that goes beyond 
just this particular topic, but it's how you approach the topic that shifts. And I'm mindful of the fact that, you know, I'm a white guy talking with two people of color, right? Um, and we've got two men and one woman and so on. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on uh, under the surface. So could you comment on that aspect? Uh, Joel, you want to give it a shot first and then uh, Ebony? Well, sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. I mean, you know, something that uh, Ebony mentioned earlier was the fact that a lot of our coastal communities are, are uh, majority black and brown people, and we know they're disproportionately disadvantaged. Uh, and disproportionately in the in the line of fire from climate change and biodiversity loss, and which could lead to fisheries collapses and uh, the loss of ec whole economies and ways of living. Um, I think you can't do modern day conservation work or protection work or even heritage preservation work without start first rooting your work in equity. And if you root your work in equity, you're looking back before you look forward. You're looking at the systemic. Wait, wait, wait a second. Let's let, let's stop. That, that's sure. really interesting. You're looking back. Could you just talk a little bit sure. about that topic? The whole idea of how looking back informs the strategies going forward. Because uh, right. in this country, don't don't we forget the past and we we just in a non contextualized way just do some more some new stuff. Well, yeah, I, I think the so you're looking back before you look forward means you're understanding the historical relationship between the peoples there and the injustices that may have taken place around certain communities, why communities have been excluded from opportunity. And when you do modern day conservation, you bring that that information forward, both in both the co-management and stewardship of these sites um, by understanding their community needs, as we've just said which can be very diverse. And I'll give you a great example. I was over the holiday, I was in American Samoa visiting the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. And of course you're surrounded by just absolutely stunning nature and beauty, uh, all aesthetic, but then you uh, engage with the community and it quickly it becomes obvious that this is a community that is disadvantaged, that does not have access to resources um, and has a tremendous pressure to conserve and protect these natural um, wonders that surround them. And the balance um, of that must be asked in terms of that question is, how do you do this in a way that also lifts up the community, that advances the community's needs who are going to be the stewards of that, of the, that, that those incredible places? And it can't work if there isn't a sustainable economy uh, to keep people employed if there isn't an education system to keep people educated about these these opportunities and to prevent the brain drain that happens on that that beautiful island uh where and a health system and and a way to eat right to nourish all yourself those things need to be so done in concert with conservation today and um listen you, you can't do it alone and i think this is something that is really needs to be stressed marine protected areas in particular and sanctuaries it's not as if all of the resources are just suddenly there because a sanctuary is created. Uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuary operates on a minuscule budget compared to the rest of the country and other public lands. So what does it do? It brings in the partners. Lots of local community partners are part of stewarding these incredible places. And what justice can do when you overlay that lens is to also bring in the importance of understanding the socioeconomic conditions of what a sanctuary or marine area is and what it can do to uplift a community when done correctly. And there are good examples within the sanctuary system of how that um, can be played out. But I want to make sure Ebony offers her thoughts too. I think you've covered it in so many ways. Um, when we say climate justice, climate justice is racial justice. And in order for us to really see the systemic changes that we need, not just in marine conservation, but also economic inequality, also uh, fossil fuel racism, all of these things at the end of the day, they're connected. And they are, are all systems that reinforce one another. So if you don't deal with the root cause at the end of the day, we really won't see the changes that we want to see. And uh, I mean, we, we, we've said this, the evidence shows, the numbers show, um, how our communities are more disproportionately impacted and um, the solutions then are found in our communities. And we need to figure out ways that we can amplify them and also um, foster greater partnerships across movements as well, 
I think that is another area that um, could help us to see shifts at, at a greater scale and pace than we have in the past. I think the intriguing thing that you're both bringing up is this whole idea of of full societal engagement, right? If if everyone has an interest in solving these issues, whether it's because you don't want to have your homes destroyed by fire and flood and and uh, hurricanes and so on and so forth, or you need food to eat or a job uh, to have, and you need to have a healthy planet at the same time, it's really a matter of triangulating the interests across different uh, societal divisions and, and creating some unity of purpose. And what could be more unifying than simply having a, a, a clean and healthy planet for your children, right? I mean, I think that the answer to that is yes, but I, I do want to just be a little real here, which is to say that not everyone is starting from the same place. And there are dimensions, different dimensions of power that have to be considered when we talk about trying to create a level set unity in terms of a um, what's been often referred to as a you know whole of government or a whole of nation um, uh, strategy to to addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. The idea of addressing the systemic inequities is to try to balance those those power in um, dynamics to ensure that people have a voice. And just as an example, this nation has just created its first ever ocean justice national strategy. That happened because a lot of people had been working for many years, dedicated and came together, coincidentally at Capitol Hill Ocean Week a few years ago, but came together to address this issue and then ensure that it could be advanced and move forward through government. And that will now create a new lens by which the decision making that goes on around national conservation efforts, which includes marine protected areas and sanctuaries uh, and other public lands, is now done through a lens where we are trying to address that power in, you know, um, discrepancy and uh, ensure that we're more rooted in the work that we do uh, going forward. It's a great point. Ebony, would you characterize Greenpeace as being idealistic, but not naive, uh, not necessarily hankering for, for a fight, but ready for it, if if that's what you need to do? Greenpeace is always ready for a fight. Uh, <laughs> but what I have been um, working with our staff and also within the broader network to ensure that we are choosing the right fights the fights that we are most positioned to take on, the fights where we know we can um, add what that that special spark that Greenpeace brings um, and ensuring that at the end of the day that we are lifting up justice and we are lifting up um, those communities that that um, are, are on the front lines and that are impacted. And to Joel's point, um, one of the ways that we do also see change is when we get folks who are impacted in the room at the table with the policy discussions and ensuring that the appropriate lens, as he said, is applied uh, to the solutions that we are advancing. So um, in, in Greenpeace, yes, we fight on the front lines, but we are also looking at how we affect and change policy. And we've seen that work also with the passing of the Global Oceans Treaty. Greenpeace was especially if um, impactful in, in getting uh, that across the finish line. And we're looking um, to advance those goals of 30 by 30. And then also with the plastic ocean, uh, I'm sorry, the plastics treaty, which we are deeply engaged in right now and understanding uh, how plastic is a fossil fuel lifeline, how it's, we spoke about this, um, damaging the ocean systems. And also now we even find it in our, our, our bodies and how it's, it's, it's impacting health. So there are a number of fights, a number of things that Greenpeace stands ready to take on and um, partnering with allies across the movement to do that. And then, like I said, also ensuring it's the right fight at the right time and that we have the right folks with us doing it. We'll, leave, we'll make that the uh, the, the uh, last word. Ebony Martin, Executive Director of Greenpeace, and Joel Johnson, President and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. 
we're going to have to do this again. We're going to have to take an even deeper dive into some of your your, your programs and initiatives. Uh, but we are so appreciative that that uh, you've agreed to to share some of the work. Please thank your staff. Please thank your boards. Please thank your partners. Please thank your donors. It is really, really important work that you're doing, and we all benefit from it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for uplifting it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.